That's the problem with knowing Mad Zane, or Mad the Lord Zane, as I like to be referred to now, is that you're going to get asked about me if you know me. And it's not because I'm just some great genius guy. Quite the contrary, I just am a lot more interesting than you are. You know, I just treat every show. Uh, I've never played the town or the country before like another show. And, you know, I, we've done enough shows as a band to, uh, to kind of read the crowd and see what we need to do to get the kind of reaction that we want out of them, ultimately. So, I mean, we're not really nervous and we don't really expect anything going into it. The only thing that we can expect, you know, is, is to walk away with a lot of people that don't really necessarily understand what happened when they first witnessed it. Nobody quite gets it at first. They see it and then they internalize it and then they truly conceive of it on a certain level uh, about 20 minutes later, later and then on a continual progressing level that just goes on to the next week or two. So it's, it's kind of like a, a, a ritualistic aspect of the performance where we, we kind of like change uh, something within the subconscious and then it, it continues to grow from there. So um, like I said, it's, yeah, I, I'm sure that I did what I expected to do. Well, now it's just the Lord. You see, Lord Nexus was a, was a magical name within itself that if you, if you actually take a literal translation, like the Lord is Master. And Nexus is a connecting tie and link between all things. And so the name literally meant a uh, uh, master connection between all things. And what it was meant to do um, when it was given to me after my first suspension was to connect me successfully from my uh, adult industry career to my music career. And I have to say it's working uh, rather well at this point in time. So now we just uh, shortened it to the Lord. So as the next record, it'll just be the Lord. But the Lord Nexus uh, came along with the uh, with the uh, suspension ritual that I originally did with my um, with my uh, uh, first video for Eric Records for the Nothing video, and it was a uh, it was it was it was done for a lot of reasons, um, primarily to escape a pact with the devil and not die at 27 and have the ability to come back and be a god or a demon, whatever you want. I mean, it was kind of just going off the whole myth. For the Robert Johnson song is sold the devil at 27 years old at the crossroads. And I don't want to have the same fate as Kurt Cobain and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison. So um, it was done on the last day of my 27th birthday and, and enabled me to not only escape death and uh, be subservient to a hell, or, uh, and all, but also bring me into a, a new state of reality that I've wanted for a long time. Well, for me, you know, I didn't think it would take me any closer to a spiritual I mean, I think it took me closer in terms of my spiritual development, uh, but closer to a God I'm not necessarily trying to do because I equate God with nature and going close to God with an annihilation. And I'm definitely not for annihilation itself or the, or, the, uh, or the crystallized essence that I've been working so hard to individuate from the masses. Um, did it have a profound effect upon my, my consciousness? Yes, it did. It, it brought me greater awareness. Uh, but I've been practicing yoga for so long that... Uh, you know, nine, nine years, and I've meditated and I've fasted for ten days at a time, and I've done a, a numerous other things that could be considered spiritual or to gain spirituality. So it, it was just another, another notch in the belt as far as that went. Uh, but I will tell you that it was the most painful of all things. I don't really know if the pain goes away. I mean, people talk about that, but it, it seemed to get more intense whenever I do suspension for some reason. And the suspension I just did for the live show back in the States, uh, where I sang actually, was the first time that ever happened. That was the most painful thing I ever did. Um, so I don't really know about it necessarily going away, but then again, people don't necessarily stay up there for, they don't stay up there for, you know, an hour, an hour and a half like I did, and they don't try to sing songs and pick up people and stuff like that. I mean, some do, but the majority of suspension artists I know, I mean, not the majority, but a lot of them, five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, that's tops, you know? I mean, perhaps... They, they, they kind of do it in a different situation as well, you know, they're not doing it in a kind of like gig situation or... Yeah, it's never been done before. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, nobody knew if it could be done before. We didn't even know. But we're all about chances, so we had to give it a shot. You know? I mean, I guess that's something you can only do what, you know, once, uh, once in a year, once every. I talked to the guy that, that got me into suspension, and I talked to my piercer, and he said I could do it every three months if I really took care of myself. But I mean, on the road, it wouldn't be a very conducive situation to do something like that because you're just so tired, you're so malnourished. I'm starving right now. Actually, it's the first day of the goddamn tour. You know, I have these these uh, protein packs I have with me, and I, I can eat five of them a day. I don't think I'd be filled up. But you know, when I'm preparing for suspension, it's 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 a really very intricate experience involved with the cardio aspects, the strength aspects, the, the yogic aspects, stretching, the meditative aspects, the abstinence, you know, the dietary regimen. Mm -hmm. So under those conditions, I'm sure I could do it every two months, every three months. But I guess if you, if you did it that often, then 
it started to get to the stage where people have come to the shows and if you didn't do it, they feel like, you know. I don't know if you guys know who the Jenna Torturers are, oh, but yeah. they, that's their curse. They can never be a real band yeah. because they're nothing but a, but a, but a theatrical show. I mean, I, it's not, I'm not saying anything bad about them when I say that, it's just the truth. I went through the same thing, very similar to them back in the day. When I did a couple of shows with them back in 99 or 98. Mm -hmm. And I used to have these big orgies on stage with girls and stuff. And, uh, and uh, a lot of people um, started coming to the show simply for the girls and to see that. And I had to make a conscious choice at that point after the Slacker Jesus record. Uh, if I was going to stop that and start over again and trying to regain fans from coming to see what we did. And I made the jump and I, and I went back all the way almost to the beginning to do it all over again. And they never had enough... Um, energy or, or desire to do that, you know, but yet they complain about never being taken seriously musically. I mean, bands have to have a, have a choice. Go back to a van, you know, rather don't tune your tour bus anymore. I'm not going to say it's easy money, but I, I will say it's addictive. It combines sex and, and money, which is the two deadliest combinations there is. Uh, I think probably the only thing more dangerous is the presidency of the United States of America. Bombs and money. Um, so yeah, it kind of it, it kind of got me there for a little bit, but I managed to get out of it and get my head back together. So be warned if you ever decide to start fucking for a living. Um, but Society One started right after I got in the uh, the porn industry because I finally felt that I could do something on my own because I had the finances to do it. And then a lot of people realized that uh, the majority of what I've been able to do is, is is due to persistence, but more so than persistence is having the financial backing to be able to do it. I mean, I didn't. I just didn't get signed by Eric Records right off the bat. I had two records previous to that, and many demos and tours and everything. You know, all, all financed by myself. You know, and, and, and Eric didn't even come on, or all the labels I wanted to sign us didn't come on until I finished Exit Through Fear first. I really had to make a, a product that was worthy, that they felt could be picked up. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, look, it's basically like this. I'm gonna have to do something musically that shadows my porn my porn career, and it's not going to be an easy thing to do. You know, I'm not going to be bashful uh, or, or um, humble about my career in porn. I mean, it was monstrous. I don't know so much about it over here in the States, but in, in, I mean, uh, in Europe, but in the States, it was, it was huge. I mean, I was the first guy ever to come forth and be on MTV and VH1 simultaneously uh, within 10 minutes of each other for a year and a half straight. I couldn't even go to a mall. Indeed, I was being bombarded like a goddamn new kid on the block, but for making pornography, signing little girls' uh, uh, books and, and schoolboys' folders. And it was huge. So, I mean, obviously, I'm going to have to do something that's even bigger than that, something that, that, that means more than that, and it's going to have to, it's going to have to be monstrous. And it's not an easy thing to do musically. I think a lot of these bands, you know, they get more just respected because that's all they do. They don't have anything to compare themselves to because who, they, who were they before? They worked at McDonald's. You know, or they worked at fucking, you know, doing a janitor, or fucking, I don't know, a garbage man, or whatever the fuck they did, you know. I wasn't, I, I was already known, I was already very, very high profile, and it was just this huge thing. So, okay, well, now he's going to do this music. Hey, well, he didn't make the Beatles Sgt. Pepper, so fuck you. You suck. Yeah, well, you know, give me some time, you know. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm going to make my, my Sgt. Pepper, but... I will say this, that in time people will understand the musical ability of this band. I think it's going to really begin with the next record that comes out next year, because uh, we've already written the majority of it, and I, I can tell you it's going, to, it's going to start to turn some heads and things are going to start to change. But I will say that the performance aspects are definitely, people start to at least admit that I'm a good performer. You know, look, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, I'm not going to say that right now this band is really a musical threat. It will be after the next record. I think right now we're musically on par with the majority of bands out there. Um, I don't think it's the music that they're afraid of. I think it's the fact that we do bring an aspect of intimacy to performing and a performance uh, to a level that some that people haven't done in a long time. And um, you know, and we're doing things that nobody's ever done before. People try to compare it to. Alice Cooper, then they try to compare it to Marilyn Manson, and they try to, you know, they go down, down all the way, but what they don't understand is, is that, yes, there's influences there, you know, uh, but, you know, we're that next level, so why is those acts going to take the next level out that is going to make them obsolete eventually? And, it's, and, that, and that's really easy, and then the bands that, that perhaps are our peers, why are they going to want a guy to come out there and do this, 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 and this, and this, and then when everything's done, people only talk about this, 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 and this. When tonight's over and fans go home, what do you think they're gonna talk about? 
yes, there are there there were other bands here tonight. Maybe they had a good set. Hey, how was so and so? They were good, but. There was this guy, believe it or not, that fucking humped this chick's head, or took this dude's hand and threw it down his pants, or pulled down his pants, or the guitar player licked his ass, or he swang from the fucking ceiling, or he rolled around on the floor in the crowd. There's a million things to, to, to think about and to talk about. And who wants that to happen at their own show? You know, I could have the worst night in my life musically and voice-wise, and still people will remember what we do even more. And maybe that's a cheap way of, of getting the attention. But at this day and age, in terms of music, you've got to do anything you can to keep people focused. It's like yelling in the middle of the room so people, everybody looks over, and then you say what you really have to say. Right now we're yelling a lot. Soon we're going to say what we have to say. But this is, I think, what the main reason why a lot of bands just aren't going to let it happen. They're just not going to let it happen. But we've been told by many people in the States, specifically, so-and-so won't let you on because of this reason. And worse yet, we've had groupies of these fans when we've been on the road, come up to us and go, hey, I was fucking so-and-so the other night, and wow, they really talk a lot of shit about you. Why is that? You know? I could name off 12 bands right now, but you wouldn't believe me, and they deny it if I said it. Mm -hmm. The same people, when you ask if they know me, they say no, but they know me. They know goddamn well who I am, and they're, they're, they're frightened to death. They dream about me. They think about me more than they even want to admit. I'm like that thorn, you know? I'm like that fucking cockroach. I'm like the thorny cockroach that just won't go away. It's a horrible analogy, but it's just the truth. I remember walking into a, a studio one day and a very famous band turned to me and said, what the fuck are you doing here? And I said, I'm recording my next record. What are you doing here? Well, I'm recording a record here too, but why are you here? It's because I'll always be here. You know, I'm gonna be here after you. I was probably here before you. And it's the truth, you'll see over time that we will be here longer than the majority of them. And I think there's a, there's a sense about that with these bands. You know, I think that there's a, something that we, that we emanate as people, as individuals you can tell that there is definitely a longevity to this that just cannot be broken regardless of trends, people's expectations, whatever. And you know, anything that is, uh, that cannot be conceived of completely, that cannot be seen as far as beginning and end goes, is somewhat infinite to, on a certain level, it's very frightening. You know, they equate it to the unknown, to, the, to, the, to your demise, to uh, actual death perhaps, or to the sinister. You know, whichever they, they, they kind of you know, equated to, it, it, it becomes this thing that is uh, very effective in, in making them want to stay away from it. And I, I personally think that's, a, that's, that's my own way of thinking about it, my own theories. And people just say that you're being egotistical and, and you have these lofty visions of yourself, but all I say is, you know, you put any of those people up next to me in, in life and I will crush them on so many different levels. It's, it's ridiculous. Their, their will and discipline and power compared to me is just, it's minuscule. It's, it's an absolute joke. It made a lot. It made it made good money. I mean, that's, that's how I survive. You know, hey, because I'm not gonna lie. I mean, you know, my record, my music career doesn't pay the bills yet. You know, it's not like I've got platinum records anywhere. You know, so I still we still gotta make the cash. It's just another way of making the, making the dough. And that's why when people ask me if I think Fred Durst is an asshole, I tell them no. I've made thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars off, of <laughs> as well as all those other bands that have been in there. So thank you very much. Some of those bands seem to be pretty embarrassed about being in that now. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, you know why? Because it's going to outlive their careers. It's going to outlive their, their musical um, uh, relativity, you know? It's going to outlive their, uh, their influence. It's going to outlive their popularity. It's already done it to Limp Bizkit, and it's already done it to Sugar Ray. It's going to do it to every one of those bands on there, whether they like it or not. And they are upset about the fact that a mere 10 minute interview by a pornographer is going to wind up being more important in their careers than their entire musical catalog and every performance they've ever done. Well, you know, you kind of look at like Papa Roach, who were complaining like, you know, two years ago, that they say, oh, we, we wish we hadn't done it, but it's like, you know, you guys, you know, you need, you need whatever publicity you can get now, so. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I told them, I remember when they originally did it, I said, if you guys do this, you will sell two million records. And I ran into the guys a couple months later and they said, Matt, they go, we sold four million and you told us if we did your video that you would go platinum, I can't believe it. But then they started bad-mouthing the whole bit, so I did a little curse on them, and now their career's in the shitter. So, you know what? That's what you get for fucking with somebody that practices black magic. That's in pornography. You gotta be careful. Oh, you know what? If somebody's spanking the girl that I'm supposed to be spanking, <laughs> I'm gonna be really fucking pissed. Hold, don't move. Go for it. One second, don't move.